me. Hello, everyone. Hi. Are you all right there at the back? Yeah? <laughs> Welcome to Icon Gallery this evening um, for the third day of our Migrant Festival. Uh, thank you for taking part. Um, We've had quite a busy day today. We've, a lot of us have been on our feet. We've had family workshops. We've had music in the galleries, uh, a performance on our canal boat, on slow boat as well. But now we're settling down for this in conversation event with Hugh and Hamad. So to introduce them more formally, uh, Hamad Nasser is a curator, writer, and researcher based in London. Until recently, he was the first executive director of the Stuart Hall Foundation and is co-curator of the British art show Nine, which will be in Wolverhampton in 2021. Between 2004 and 12, Hamad ran with, an, with Anita Darwood, who's also here in the audience, Green Cardamon in London, with a program informed by artistic practice in Pakistan, South and West Asia. And between 2012 and 16, he was head of research and programs at Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong. With Kate Jessen, he has recently co-curated the exhibition Speech Acts, Reflections, Imagination, Repetition at Manchester Art Gallery, which poses the questions, what do pub public museums collect and why? Which works become highlights and which lie forgotten in storage? I'd also like to welcome back London-based artist Hugh Locke, whose exhibition, Here's the Thing That You're Sitting In Right Now, closes at Icon tomorrow. After this, it's going to tour to two venues in the States, including the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas City and the Colby College Museum of Art in Maine. And it's with Kemper and Colby that Icon has published this exhibition catalogue our plan at ICON is to work with Hugh again in time for the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham in 2022. And this is outlined on our, in our Migrant Festival um, brochure um, and will be touched upon this evening. Last week, on the 24th of May, the 200th anniversary of Queen Victoria's birth, historically celebrated as Empire Day, we programmed a walking tour starting at Birmingham Statue of Queen Victoria and including a tour with Hugh of his exhibition. The idea for this walk, and in fact the overall program of the Migrant Festival this year, is the result of our conversations with both Hugh and Hamad, informed by Stuart Hall's writing on cultural heritage. And I'd like to say a huge thank you to both of you for your endless generosity and support, continuing to share your research, your ideas with me my colleagues here at ICON and our audiences tonight. So thank you very much. Um, and I'll begin by thanking Lindsay Straightback for organizing this and for Indra um, and your help in putting some things together. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. Um, for the next half an hour or so, we will have a little conversation which we've tried not to rehearse. So we had the briefest of telephone conversations in which we repeated to each other twice, okay, we're not gonna talk more because otherwise we'll have the conversation now. Uh, so we haven't done that. What we have selected is a series of images, ideas um, that perhaps will allow points of entry into Hugh's work. Um, and in terms of entering the work, um, where best is to start than the title, here's the thing. Um, now the thing, of course, is many things. Um, it is objects, but also incidents, um, historical relationships, um, stories. It suggests an explanation, but as many of you um, would have felt when you go around the exhibition, and you can go around the exhibition many times, it also, it resists explaining. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I've spent my whole artistic career trying to dodge being pinned down completely, trying not to be deliberately ambiguous in an irritating way, 
but trying to um, do something which is complex. The older I get, the more complex things get. Oh God, I wish I could find simple answers, you know, but I, f I find um, I read things in a more complex way. Well, I, I think this also then comes across in, um, to me, in your sort of, uh, in the way that you deal with ideas of history. Hmm. So this, um, this is a history that is full of repetitions, of rhymes, of echoes. It's a kind of a restless history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, 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 I always look at where, it's, it's looking at history, but to look at where we are now. Oh. How did we get here? I mean, um, for example, the, the share certificates upstairs, that was a direct response to the financial crash in 2008. I was in, I, I was look, I was in New York at when Lehman Brothers folded, and um, I came back and not knowing what to do. And I had this inkling of an idea, and that helped me to deal with the panic, because trust me, for those of you who have forgotten, and I, I showed, uh, that was panic, you know what I mean? The world's about to collapse, and so I, I ended up investing in, in dead companies. And it, it helped to soothe my brain, you know. But it it's also serves as a really wonderful example of um, uh, of the power of objects. Exactly, um, exactly. And within the show, we we see you using objects in multifarious ways. Um, um, objects as sort of everyday material, and we'll sort of come back to your choice of materials mm -hmm. as stores of value. Yeah. In those yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. share certificates, yeah. as um, as a sort of a Votive offerings. Yes, exactly, um, exactly, exactly. Um, and and of course, sort of ethnographic, almost sort of representation. But allied to all of this is the idea of um, of objects as something that is collected. Yeah. yeah? yeah so whether yeah. it's for the individual or quite often, it's a collection of cultures. No? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Say, for example, in, in the busts upstairs, the Parian busts. Again, that was an instinct of an idea I had, a germ of an idea. And I bought a, a, a bust of Queen Victoria, young Queen Victoria. Um, this is before the television series and all that nonsense, but that's another conversation. Um, I bought it, and it was a souvenir from the Crystal Palace. And it was an object of history, and I sort of wanted to get that object of history and weigh it down with even more history. You know? well, where did you buy it from? I bought it from an antique shop, um, and the thing with these is you, you don't want to keep getting, you, you don't reveal your motives to these guys, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, you keep it quiet, <laughs> unless you want a, 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 a difficult conversation, you know, like, I can't sell this work to this guy, he's not a true patriot. You know? yeah. <laughs> I think we'll come back to that, con <laughs> uh, that question of patriotism. I think there'll, there'll be something that, um, uh, that'll be one of the layers uh, yeah, exactly. that, that we'll the, work through in this yeah. conversation. But I, um, I also wanted us to just address the room we're in. Yes. Um, and this particular project, Nameless, yes, we can see it's a procession. Yes. Um, in, in the catalog, you talk about it as, um, as a sort of stream of consciousness. Yes, exactly, exactly. It's, it's, an, uh, it's, it's, it's from an archive collected over many years. And um, it just seemed like I'll do this because I want to do this. And um, I should say the, the way the idea came from, the technique, te um, necessity for me often is the mother of invention. In 2004, I was in a show in Atlanta, in Georgia, and they ran out of money to ship a big cardboard piece. So they had a big room to fill with something and no money. So right, okay, fine, what do we do? And at late at night, as always happens, three o'clock in the morning, panicking, right? Uh, like, ah, simple idea. Get a drawing, project it on the wall, draw it, get some cheap cord, stick that on there, get some beads, stick that on there, and then that'll work. And the, the, the tearing, the, the, the drips of these beads is echoing a tapestry. So it's, the whole thing is echoing a broken tapestry. But what it's about is about something which is a, an everyday stuff. Um, 
cheap everyday stuff, but turning it into something much more than that, like Arte Povera kind of style, you know. Um, and the beads, I went around Atlanta back then. Um, I bought every single Halloween bead necklace I could find, yeah. and that, and but no. And you caused a run on Halloween beads. Yes, yeah, yeah. They, they, I, I cleaned the whole place out, you know. <laughs> but this. Um this interest in what you're calling a sort of an urban arte povera. Yes, will, yes, 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 yes. Um, and, and that you can see sort of throughout the exhibition through your mo means of yeah, working. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and is, is that almost like a rule you set up for yourself? There's no rule. It, it's, it's purely instinct. Um, this, this way of working, as I said, it came as a necessity thing, but also it's about the idea of you, you make something from something which is very basic, but then you make it in such a way that people walk up to and say, oh, it's just made with that. And then you step back and think, oh, but it's become that. You know, you know what I mean? So you, you trans, I love the transformation, transformative aspect of art. It's, a lot of artists are, are interested in the idea where you take a simple material and you turn it into something quite different, you know? But there's also something quite sort of uh, visceral and bodily to this, and you know. Yes, 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 and 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 the idea behind this as well, this particular piece of work, is that you, you, sh you should it should feel tactile. Yeah. It should feel like um, like it, it it would imprint on your hand if you touch it, and it should feel like it's it's almost um, you, you don't want to really touch it, not for the fact of it being fragile, which it is, but for the fact of. I don't want to touch these dudes, you know what I mean? <laughs> don't want to disturb them. We never know what could happen in the night, you know? Um, I mean, one of the things that sort of st struck me um, walking around this and looking at it is there's, there's, a, there's a certain excess uh, to yes, it. It's almost yes. as if, uh, you know, the things that are coming out, these string beads, they're oozing out. They can't be contained. Exactly. Yeah. And this is something I've been doing. I used to do um, years ago with, with, with que queen portraits, very strange queen portraits I did. And it's, it, I associate it with memories of Guyana, Guyana being a tropical country, and everything is rotting. Right. You know, you, you leave it for too long and it'll start to ooze and drip. And so, they, so th while these may reference broken threads in tapestries, it's also dripping and, oozing and falling apart. That's it. Things falling apart is, is for me a big thing in my work. I, I, imperfection, but, but definitely things being broken and falling apart. And when I went back to Guyana in the early, in, in mid early 90s, I realized where this came from. I came from a country where you'd build a wooden house and if you don't watch it, wood ants will come and just tear it apart, you know, and things fall apart. Uh, which is, of course, a wonderful title. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah exactly, of a, exactly. Of a Chinua Achebe uh, book, but it also serves as a kind of a, uh, a reflection um, for Britain, uh, I think, and, this, I, and the afterlife of empire. Yeah. which in, certainly in your work is also kind of oozing out. Yes, yes. And for me, um, I always feel, feel that people think this whole empire thing, why you always go on about it so much? It's a bit, a bit passe. But it's, it's led us, I think, not completely, I would say, but in part to this position we find ourselves right now in this country. I, I, I think this is a, empire is, and that messy history is, is, is still there with us. It sort of, so I'm, I'm drifting off from you quite a good. No, no, yeah. I think it's, it's very, um, it's very central, I think. Yeah. To certainly yeah. your work. It's, yeah, it's, it, it's definitely quite central to, to where, I, where I'm coming from. It's not what it's all about, but, but, yeah. uh, but it's, it's empire as how things, how it makes things today, you know what I mean? It's empire in how right now I notice lots of program and television thinking, hang on a minute, these people are going through a period of amnesia. Don't they remember this thing was not wonderful, you know? I mean, back in the day, we would be considered second class citizens, you know what I mean? If not third class or something like that, I don't know. But, but, but empire was a, it was a thing of control, you know. Well, it's not just back in the day. Yeah, yeah, I, I was trying. <laughs> <laughs> you have the Windrush uh, exactly, model. Exactly, uh, exactly, in, in exactly. In your Armada work. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that was, um, yeah. And as I was saying la briefly last night, that when I saw that a friend of mine was caught up in this, I was like quite shocked, you know, quite shocked. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it his, history has history has a, a, a way. It, it, I, you know, I I always say that what we're doing sometimes is we carrying this baggage of history, even when we're not aware of it. You know, even when we, you know, we, we, it's still there. You know what I mean? And uh, and you sort of ignore it at your peril. I feel. You know. Well, not just also ignore it, but it's also not a given. So part of the, the challenge, of course, is that histories are always um, constructed and yes. reconstructed. And reconstructed, and reconstructed. absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and, and they're reconstructed now. Yes, uh, so there exactly. Is a, there exactly. is a, almost a curatorial <coughs> process about which history you wish to construct, confront, acknowledge, accept. Hmm. And in some ways, um, or in many ways, I see your sort of long-term practice as, as a way of kind of uh, trying to reveal or just the layers of, of, the, of these histories that sit on top of each other, get entangled, ooze out. Yeah, 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 exa uh, exactly. And for me, I mean, I've always said, and it's a cliche thing I say a lot about my work, is that there's layers of meaning and layers of history, but also layers of material, and, and, and they, they're both... They're, they're the same thing, you know what I mean, for me. But, the, but definitely layers of history. And, and, it's, and it, history is layered and it's messy and you can't quite pin it down sometimes and then it will jump and change and become something different, you know? Well, let's... Um, well, if we can work this thing. Ah, there we go. Ah. Um, so what we're looking at, I'm not sure everybody could read, but I'll read, re read it, uh, the title out for you. It's called Grin and Bear It. The Queen's Coat of Arms. Um, and it's the mixed media listed includes textile, plastic, artificial hair. Hugh, tell us about this work. Okay. This, um, it's interesting how things have gone in this country now, but I mean, um, 2004, I started to look at ideas, that were early 2000s, I had to look at ideas of nationhood. And what is it to be British? What do people hold up as their ideas of being British, and ideas of Britishness? And so, I came up with this. But this is this is the Queen's coat of arms. But this is actually based on my passport, because I kept I looked at this document and thought this is a document which people are killing for. People are really desperate to get hold of. Um, members, there are some members of my family who, unlike me, were not born here, and all of a sudden. A, 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 few, a few months difference makes quite a difference to your life. And also, as I'm looking at it as a document which people are dying, li literally dying for, basically, to, to, get, to get here for. That's long before all the, all the migrant crisis we got going on now. But it's about ideas and identity. And obviously, the title, Grin and Bear It, I mean, it's a bit of a joke, obviously. But it's, it, it, this thing is quite a spiky thing. I mean, the physically, if you touch this, you could scratch yourself. You know, so it's, yeah. And the colors? The colors were just, again, instinctive. I mean, these are Guyanese colors for me. That I was in red, yellow, green, yellow being for standing in for gold in this case. But they're, um, yeah, it, it's, it's just, it's, I, I have my, color, my color palette is, is instinctive. And uh, it, I see it in other artists like, Aubrey Williams, you know, I, I grew up with, a, I, I grew up with this, what, seeing certain artists around me and thinking, ah, yes, that's where, where I'm coming from with this, you know, without realizing it, you know. So the coat of arms, of course, is also a symbol. You know, yes, so it's, it's yes, a symbolic yes, yes. object. Yes, exactly, um, exactly. As, of course, are statues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and statues feature, um, very prominently in, in sort of, certainly over the last say, 10, 15 years in your, in your work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, um, again, <laughs> I spent my career looking for unfashionable causes, shall we say, uh, unfashionable topics. And, I, and it, this interest came up because of, I was looking at um, statues in London and people were passing them by every day, not really paying attention to them. So I did a proposal of, of dressing them in 
mad colors and different stuff, making them into votive objects. That was not accepted, and so the proposals became the work, impossible proposals. But I realized that this particular, these sort of images you guys are looking at now, this is where the original image inspiration came from. When I was a kid, this Queen Victoria statue was removed from in front of what was then the Victoria Law Courts, which was... Which is a very common... Uh, oh, yes. So when I was a kid in yes. Lahore, I can remember the, the statue of Queen Victoria being removed. Oh, seriously? Yeah. Oh, right. You uh, see, we then rehearsed this. <laughs> 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 and, 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 and there are sort of these, and in India, for instance, there's almost like a little, um, uh, outside New Delhi, there is this, it almost functions as a graveyard for imperial yes, statues. Yes, 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 yeah. I know that. I yeah. just think that's amazing. Yeah. I think that's really quite a thing, you know. It's this sort of park of ghosts, you know. And, and it's, it, it sort of goes back to the, that symbolic power of statues. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then the symbolic power of statues is interesting because what happened yeah. is that... Um, the president at the time dies, politics changes, shifts, time has changed, and somebody must have said, let's put her back now, you know? And so, so they go to the back of the botanical gardens where she'd been unceremoniously dumped, as we were saying, Guyana, behind God's back, and she's brought back, and she's put up there, and it's fine, we pass her by, and we're indifferent to her because it's just part of history. But what happens with that red paint, that's recent, that's in the last year or so. And so obviously, not everybody was in, is indifferent to this. And yeah. I suppose it's also become statues worldwide yes. have become kind of a site for contestation. Exactly, you know? exactly, exactly, you know. Uh, and um, yeah. Whether it's roads must fall, or Colston, which you... Yes, become. exactly. Whether it's Road Must Fall or Colston, they become this, 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 this um, <coughs> point of, um, of, 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 of as it, well, conflict, you know. Which, of course... Um, so so this, this is the same statue. Yeah. I, I in, and I in front of the Victoria Law Courts. And I thought that what you're looking at is a photograph, and it's been carefully primed, prepared, and... The law courts have been painted out in greys, and what you've got is the ghosts of empire behind Queen Victoria there. Um, Amerindian symbols, Guyanese architecture, and yeah, it's... And I went back specially to Guyana to photograph this statue. Oh, by the way, the reason why it's, why, why it's got no hand and, and, and it's that damage is because it was bombed dynamited by Guyana's Port Laureate Martin Carter during independence conflicts. And he was put in jail for that. And so that then think brings us to the, ah, yes. the proposal that uh, Lindsay just mentioned that yes, you were developing yes, yes, yes. for the Commonwealth Games. Yes, yes. so this is, the, this is the grand proposal. To, this is the statue, the Queen Victoria statue in Birmingham. And the plan is that, the idea is that these statues were exported all over the world. Let's create, I mean, I want to cr propose to create a boat, build a boat around the statue, put her in a crate as if she's been shipped around the world, but, she's b b but with all the multiples, you know, so she's... So this is Empire 2.0. Yeah. yeah, 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 but, but, but the thing is, it's not just about that. It's about the fact that um, this is a, unif in, in a, a bizarrely unifying thing. It's almost like, does it... Uh, uh, well, strange thing to say that, but I mean, it's, it's a shared history, shall we say, with many countries. The, 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 sta the statue is sent around quite a few places, and, and, and identical quite often, you know, and that's quite fascinating. Fascinating as well to me, the fact that this statue is not even the original statue, it's a bronze of a marble, which just disintegrated too much because of pollution. So it's all, so it's all, all artifice. But I love the idea of, of, of it as a, her carrying a bunch of multiples, you know, it's a bit like, I don't know, it's, it's a strange Egyptian feel to me, to, to me in one way or another. But there's also something um, in, in this sort of, it's a figure of benevolence. In, yes. In some kind of Yes, a, absolutely, you know, absolutely. This is your mother, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, um, you know, yeah. how could you object? No, how could you object? To being you know, ruled by her. E exactly, exactly. Yeah. Not to, exactly. How could you object to this? It's, um, you know, she's a um, you know, benevolent um, maternal figure, you know? That was how it was pitched anyway.
Ah, right. So we, we're still with queens. Still with queens, indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, I started doing these royal family queen portraits in early 2000s. And quite often when I do something, I think, well, let's not analyze why I want to do it. Just do it, and then I'll come up with a reason later. You know what I mean? So, you know, so, so I started doing a drawing. I did a drawing of Princess Margaret on her 16th birthday, you know, 16th birthday photographs. So this, and, uh, and, um, and I, this is after I'd done a series of reworkings of Velasquez's Las Meninas and Velasquez's Infantas. So powerful women, but, tra um, but trapped in these massive dresses and traded as on, on board as um, pawn for pawns for p European power. Anyway, and what I, and I, and I, I can't understand why I want to do this. So I'm doing this drawing, and then I did another drawing of the queen, and it took me a while to remember that when I was a kid at school, I went to a school run by Anglican nuns in Guyana. The I had the last vestiges of a colonial education in Guyana. And the, all the exercise books, the books you'd write your notes in, they all had the queen's face on them. And of course, you're a kid, you know, mustache, beard, spectacles, you know. It was, and that didn't go down well, you know, to, you know so, I mean, for all of us, because we, we all did it, you know what I mean? And that was where this thing came from, this fascination. Uh, but, so that, so, so it's a, but, but then, by that, by that my, so that's a personal fascination. But then there's the, 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 the fascination, but ideas of nationhood and all these images, 2004, 2002, this is all post 9-11. So I'm a looking at the country, looking at itself. Who are our symbols of nationhood? Who do we hold up, you know? And working on this, this is cut from cardboard. And you, I was aware of the fact that it's quite, it felt quite perverse at the time to be slicing the queen's face, creating an image but cutting it up. It felt, it felt very weird because she's such a revered figure, you know? And why cardboard? What, what is it about? Oh, cardboard. Was a, I, I haven't used cardboard for a while, but cardboard, it, it just is, it was cheap, effective. But also, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful material. And I became obsessed with cardboard. I became obsessed with cardboard to the point where I'd be going down Brick Lane looking for boxes because I figured that the cardboard from Thailand, the, the, all those fruit boxes, Thai, Thai cardboard is distinctive in a lovely yellow shade and stuff <laughs> like that. I, I became a connoisseur of cardboard. Uh, uh, you know? And, and what are you doing with your cardboard collection? Has that been promised to the museum somewhere? The, the cardboard collection is dotted around the place, shall we say. I mean, the biggest piece is with a, with a museum in Miami. Well, cardboard is interesting because, again, it's taking us back to this idea of packaging. You know? Exactly, uh, exactly. Of objects, or exactly. must be packaged. And then thinking about the queen, uh, whether it's the bust, the cardboard portrait, yeah. or the, the public sculpture as itself a kind of packaging, a kind of a commodification of an image. Um, it's, in some way, it's the sort of cool Britannia a couple of hundred years before Blair, yeah? Yeah, yes, 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 yeah. I mean, and, and that's, it's, and also it's a package which is, um, it's, this is how, what we sell to the world, yeah. you know what I mean? The, 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 this, this, is, this is it, so all the open top buses going around Trafalgar Square, like, this is this is our history, but also it's it's, it's part of the become part of the heritage industry, you know. Well, I mean, this is I was having a conversation with another artist who's yeah. looking at certain historical moments, and we were just talking about you know because of course nations are myths, you know? they are yeah. they are yeah. I I constructions of the imagination, and uh, and they are then repeated with, with stories. Yeah. And one of the things is oh yes you know we're this is a mercantile nation. You yep. know, we trade, yep. uh, or you know, this is a, a naval nation. You know, we sort of uh, project power literally yeah. uh, through the navy. Uh, but at its heart, in some ways, I think it's we're we're a marketing nation. Yeah, we're good at selling, man. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's 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 really about that packaging and constructing that story. That that you're kind of trying to sort of. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm, it's like I'm trying to pick away at that story. Yeah. You know what I mean? And just quite literally at that uh, with that cardboard. Yes, 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 and just question it and stuff like that. And I question it for myself as well, sort of. Um, and oh, one thing I should say is that my position, vis-a-vis -vis the Queen, particularly, is I'm not a royalist, nor am I a republican. 
I'm somebody in between, sort of, as I used to say in the di back in the day, w uh, sitting on the fence but watching people throw bottles and stuff at each other from the other side, you know. Uh, but but I, because I find that um, position quite, I find the whole institution quite intriguing. The, there's an image in the next gallery that was done three days before the Ira the, of the Queen. That was done three days before the Iraq War kicked off in 2003, and that's me using that image of the Queen to think: Well, what is this thing of a nation? W people are going to fight for Queen and countries. That's a, that's a strange thing. I'm, I'm not saying it's a horrible thing, but it's it's a very strange thing, you know, to me. And I, I'm looking at it almost as if. Like, like, like somebody from Mars might look at it, if you see what I mean. Well, that actually takes us uh, to the next object that we want to, you know, yeah. while we've been talking about the Queen, and in some way those depictions as a projection of soft power. Yes, yes, yes. This is the, um, the, uh, the iron fist. This is, this, 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 this is the real deal, you know. Yeah. Um, so this is... Um, based on a similar boat to HMS Belfast, I think it's a George the fifth class um, boat, and it's a model boat, and it's covered in um, markings, sort of a bit like dazzle ship markings, but what you can't quite see, if I had a laser pointer, I would do something, is it's covered in tiny little skulls, and it's part of, linked to uh, the piece which we'll show a bit later, the, the, uh, the Belfast piece, but um, it's, it's about this thing as, um, I wouldn't say gunboat diplomacy necessarily, but I mean, it's about we're, we're coming to your place on an official visit. We're kind of showing you who's in charge, you know what I mean? That, that's what this is about, you know? Yeah, and, and uh, or I should say that when I was a kid in Guyana, my earliest memories were British troops training on the, on the sea wall. I, I, I lived right by the sea. And um, we'd shout to them as kids. They, they, that was our morning entertainment. Shout them to lend me your gun. You know what I mean? And and uh, they they were there uh, because there, were there was sort of internecine conflict in Guyana at the time, which is a bit too complex to go into. But it was it was more than that. It was it was kind of it was a bit, a bit of show of force and stuff. But I always remember these guys, and and they would have come off this boat, basically a boat just like this. That's what I mean, you know. Like and. This, of course, then connects to um, the work that we see yes. in the, the room next to yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But before we talk about uh, the video itself, could you tell us a little bit about that intervention at, with HMS Belfast? How did it come about? Okay, there's a piece, a, draw, a painting of HMS Belfast in the next room there. I did that um, because I found it fascinating in the same way that London statues are fascinating. They are visible but invisible at the same time. HMS Belfast is an iconic thing. So I did this thing, and then one of the curators came by the gallery, and this was on show in the back room, and, the, and com a few conversations took place with my gallerist, um, Hale's Gallery, we give them a little plug there. But, you know, um, and um, they, the, the, the curator said, well, this, this, maybe this proposed something for HMS Belfast. So I proposed something grand, and always happens with things like you propose something, blue skies thinking, you know, so I was going to cover the boat in nuclear missiles, turn it in, <laughs> and I was like, and they look, okay, right, well, half a million pounds, that's not really going to work. Is it? You, fig you, f you figure out quickly, quick, certain things aren't going to work. And but what I realized was that um, the, there were all these mannequins inside the boat, and all you needed to do was to put a mask on them, and you'd alter the narrative of the story. And what I, in looking into the history of, of HMS Belfast, on its last journey, it came and gave, handed over independence to Jamaica. In other words, you, we, we're in a boat, we, we're in a harbor. It's a kind of weird benevolence. I mean, put it this way, you're handing over independence, you don't bring a cruise ship to hand over independence, you bring a gun boat, you know? Anyway, and, and then they went to Trinidad and, and, and then came back up to, to, to back home. But Trinidad in, in August, and I thought, what if they arrived in Trinidad in time for Carnival, you know? And what would kind of what kind of band would they, what kind of mass would they play, you know? And I thought, okay, right, this has got this can work. And then you and we made a mask in the studio, working a mask in the studio, and went down with a couple of assistants, and we put the masks on these mannequins, and it's like, 
oh, bloody hell, this really works. And then it's a question of like, are they going to allow me to do it? You know, and the curators were great, you know, the curators, and they were like, yeah, this works. And then, they, then, then and it worked um, up to a point, but that, that's another conversation. But go on. Up okay, to what up, point? okay, okay, right. <laughs> point being, right, the show is going on, you know, the man's thinking, well, this is one of the mo most exciting things I've done. I was like, God, they allow me to do this and stuff like that. They even allow me to put a little guy in with all the shell rack and stuff like that, you know. Um, anyway, and, but, oh, it's just, and, it's, 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 that, that, so this is some of the inspiration behind it. So, I, the, so the, the top right hand, top, yeah, right hand corner, that's a figure called Midnight Robber. And it's a traditional Trinidad Carnival figure. He props up again at the bottom. At the bottom right, that's Peter Minchel, sort of famous, um, very amazing Trinidad um, carnival mask, mask guy, or, or designer. Um, did a couple of Olympics as well. Anyway, and, and the top two are Sailor Mass. Sailor Mass, which is a traditional Trinidad thing, Sailor Mass, it's their sailors in HMS Belfast, it seemed logical. Okay, so the show is on, right, and uh, about, Five weeks into the show, I get a phone call, and it's like, Hugh, there's a problem. There's an article in the Times by somebody who's a historian, a military historian, somebody, who's very, very angry, you know, with, 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 with the museum, very angry with me, you know. And, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm in this sort of firefight of having to defend the piece because he thought of it was a sacrilege and stuff. And what he, this guy didn't realize that this is not satire. This, this, is, this, is, this is a serious con comment on so people who are like uh, one second from death. You know, it's, it's, it's what they're in a dialogue and it's about um, them letting off steam. It's not a, it wasn't designed as an anti-military or anti-Navy piece at all. It's just a, 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 an investigation into this kind of ideas of fear, you know, because as I said, I mean, these guys could be blown up any minute, you know. They're, they're living through the Cold War. They lived through World War II, you know. And I had to go on the radio and defend it and stuff like that. And in the end, TripAdvisor was saying, don't go and see this thing and stuff like that. Wait until it goes and stuff. The whole thing became a bit, a bit ridiculous. And the show closed early, which I couldn't prevent, you know. And I still think... Um, that was a great piece of work, man. You know, that was it was the the, 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 the show took over the whole. Well, you, you look at the film next door. You see, you understand what I mean. That the film is is is, is a an imaginative documentation of, of of the thing. You know. But I think it, it what it also shows is the um, the power of cultural intervention. Exactly, and, and what it also shows is that certain things haven't quite changed because the subtext. And I'm not stupid, reading between the lines. In fact, Richard Drayton was commenting on this. Who, Richard Drayton who's written an article, one of the articles in, one of the essays in the catalog. He was commenting on it. And the, the, the subtext behind this critique was, how dare this so-and-so from some jumped up country come here and you know, besmirch our national reputation. You know, that's what the subtext was. And I'm not being overly paranoid and saying that that's what it was. You know? And the guy didn't get it. It was a poetic response to conflict, to fear, you know? But it's, I think it's also um, a, a sort of a public tendency to avert our gaze from actually looking at history. Yes. Um, I mean, one of the th conversations we've had, and, and that is another conversation, is that I think perhaps we need in Britain to be a little bit more Germanic about our relationship with our histories. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, we need to yeah. stop commemorating just the bit of the war and think yeah. about what happened a few hundred years before. Yes, yes, because well. I've been involved in a project in Germany, which you haven't got image, but that's another conversation, yeah. which would, would Germany re looking at their colonial history, yeah. you know, after many years of obviously still dealing with the, the First World War, sorry, Second, Second World War, War. thing. Um, so... And, and for those of you who haven't had a chance to see uh, the film, I think that's one one good thing that came out of that. Yes, work that's being one stopped. good thing which came out uh, of it. Because the film is 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 how the thing felt. I mean, it was it was the, I should say that the, the installation in the HMS Belfast was in loads and loads of rooms. It was throughout the boat, so it's a very cumulative effect. You're going up deck, down deck. It was all over the place. It was it, it was. 
it was really was something. It was quite a wonderful thing. Quite dark, but to mean fantastically dark, if you see what I mean. Well, I, I was not here, so I didn't get to see uh, yeah. the actual intervention, but uh, from just seeing the film, I think I, you, I certainly got that impression, and it's a, it's a powerful piece of work. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the last image that I wanted to talk about, I think this is again this is, uh, in the film, and again we, we see the Queen coming back. Yes, 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 um, yes, yes. And, yes, and the yes, music, yes. you know, there's a sort of a version of God Save yes, the Queen. Yes, the version of God Save the Queen, like, like a, a Caribbean version, you know. Yeah. So, so again we have the figure of the Queen, um, and in, you know, what, what they're doing with this gunboat diplomacy, as so you uh, so coyly put it, yeah. uh, is, is feeding the Queen. I'm trying to be polite. <laughs> Is, is feeding the queen. Yeah. yeah. Um, ah, yes, yes. And I wanted to end at least this bit, and we're going to open it up to, uh, yes. so I hope you have your questions ready, yeah. is to come back to that idea of Britishness that we mentioned yes, right in the start. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about, well, we can see 2016, so we have gone 40 minutes without using the B word, uh, but, you but know, this is about the B word. This is, and about the, the, the B this is a piece word. I did with my wife, who sits in the audience. I can't see her. Indra, oh, there, Indra Khanna. Um, and um, yeah, this, 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 we, we, we were asked to make a comment on this. It's about, it's about um, uh, the mayor of London had a, 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 a thing called London is Open. So it's a series of posters in bus sheds. And it's trying to talk about the fact that um, we're trying to pull away from Europe, we're trying to sh close things down. And this is talking about the fact is that this city in particular, London, has always been spread out to the world, to Europe. You know, it's, 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 it's always been like that. It's not, um, well, you can just read, you can, these, are, these, these are just, uh, these, these, are, these are street names in London. And it's just London's international European history is just written in the streets, you know? I think what, what it does so powerfully um, is also, there is this kind of, you know, this toxic discourse uh, in politics about this, you know, citizens of I should say, somewhere and yeah. citizens of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. And if you then think about Britain, London, as a somewhere that is made from elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and you know that relationship, which is entangled, complex, complicated. Um, you know, we are here because you were there. Exactly. In Stuart exactly, Hall's exactly, words. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Is yeah. is um, you you can't get back to a somewhere which is pure and and on its own because that was never there. That's a mythical. Yes. Creation. No. It's, it's a mythical, and it's always been a mythical yeah. thing. You know, it's, it's the, the the idea of a, a pure situation. Um, I'm not going to backtrack in what we were talking about last night, but I mean, that, 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 that idea of things being this pure, perfect thing, and then all these foreigners come up, I mean, um, it, 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 for all these foreigners come in, it's, it's, not, um, it's not like that at all. It was never pure or anything like that, you know? Well, that seems like an appropriate m moment to actually open it up to the floor. There are a couple of mics here, so um, any questions, please just raise your hand and wait for the mic to come to you. Well, Hugh, thank you very much for that. Uh, you have given me a, a tremendous insight into how an artist functions. And I just wonder, my question is, you, you mentioned complexity, you mentioned stream of consciousness, you mentioned in instinct, and you mentioned doing the work and then figuring it out afterwards. And I, you, it's almost as if the artist becomes a conduit that channels the complexity and then turns out all these wonderful images that have been processed by the arts. Is, is that a fair way to describe um, how you function? It's, it's a, a bit of that, but then 
It's about looking. Like, I, I, I give you an example how I, how I operate and how I think a lot of artists operate. Like, I spend a lot of my time going around museums, and I'll be walking around, say, the Victoria and Albert Museums, which I go to a lot, you know. And I'll be walking and thinking, and I'm, I'm making work all the time. Making and uh, no, that's not going to work. That's going to work, you know. And, 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 then, and then thinking, yeah, well, then, then going, oh, that could work. That idea could work. And then, <coughs> it, then it's back to the studio. So it's, it's a constant thing of constantly being interested. Like most artists, I would like to think, you're constantly being, constant stage of being fascinated to the point where it can be bloody exhausting, thinking, oh, God, you know, too many ideas, you know, to me. Oh, by the way, yeah, that's one thing about me. Um, I, never, I never have a problem with mental block or anything. The block is this overload, you know, to me, too, you know. But, uh, yeah, it's... But l lots of ideas and thoughts are flowing through, and it's then it's what to do, you know, to me. And then it's like how to make it work. But the, ma the, the work itself, the process of working, is what, re what how what, how you discover things for me and for me that's for me anyway like like doing these things is like these the room we're in right now I wasn't sure how this was going to work but I th but it, it started to reveal itself through the process of actually making it but you have to have a uh, for me sometimes I have to have a, a, a reasonable idea at first you know yeah. So doing is also thinking. Doing is thinking, exactly. Yeah. Doing is thinking. That's it. Oh, I've got to use that one. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had a question here. Right. Um, when you're talking about when your ideas come to you, um, do you think about how they would be perceived? Because you said obviously you got a reaction from mm. the, the, the mm -hmm. Belfast mm -hmm. one. I mean, is it idea and concept or... I, 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 I'm, yeah, I, I, that's a good point because I am thinking at times how things will be perceived, but at the same time, being careful not to allow that to 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 stop me from doing something, because you can you can overthink things. It's for me, I can I can over, I, I can overthink things quite okay, easily. Occasionally, it can get slightly in the way. But at the same time, it's, it's like, well, how will this work? It's a, it, quite often it's, but how will this hit the viewer? How, how, how will they, because you never can know, but how, how, will people, how will people react to this? Um, how will they see it visually? And in the studio, I'm like, well, this is, like this, what's, what's wrong with this? And it's, it, it's about thinking while working, that, that same but thing. You know? let's talk about that in relation to this yeah. work here. Yeah. Because one of the things that's really interesting about this is this is this is confronting people in the public sphere, yes. even much more so than people who would you know go to HMS Belfast. Yes. Uh, so this is while you wait for your bus, mm -hmm. it's still 2016. Uh, you know those emotions are still raw. The country is still divided, but you know th there's a certain oomph to this work. Um, you want people to think about it. Yeah. Well. Well. well I mean. When we were talking about it, me and Andrew, because it's a, it's a giant piece of work, um, it, 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 it was. Well, for, first of all, the, 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 the difficulty was we, we spent a lot of time looking for place names that didn't refer to battles or wars. So, so, so that, that was that was the first thing, you know. And um, I don't know what to say, really, you know. It just worked. It was such a succinct idea, you know what I mean? I mean, I, mean, I think it was just relating it into the question of thinking about people. Yeah. How will oh, right. people so, sorry, receive? Sorry, 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 yeah. sorry. Yeah. It's a bit like we are addressing, I suppose, a London and an international audience with this. You know, that's what it was about. We, that's what we were about. And it was, and, and, and thinking people would look at it and go, oh, hang on a minute. I know that street, or I passed that street, and getting people to think about the city that they live in, in relation to that vote which had just been passed, you know, and not just that, but to think of other cities, because other cities in in in, in Britain would have a similar kind of thing. I mean, Liverpool would have cities maybe relating to all sorts of different things, you know, and it's most of the, the, the cities in this country, the, the streets are. It's back to history again. There's history there, you know what I mean? It's uh, uh. We have 
one right next to you and then a lady at the back. Um, speaking about this piece as well, I noticed that there's different levels of emphasis. So the signs are different sizes. Some of them are quite a bit more bold than the others. Was that a deliberate choice or is that? That's a design choice, yeah. A yeah, design yeah, choice yeah, yeah, yeah. as opposed to a message yeah. behind that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask a question, Hugh, uh, about place, which connects to the image we're looking at there. It's very strange, it's because there's an Indra sitting right there. <laughs> <She's like laughs> to Indra anyway. and Hugh, both anyway. of you. Um, and also, um, to go back to your Imperial War Museum project, yeah. um, I believe your intervention was called the tourists, yes. is that right? Yes. So can you tell us a little bit more about tourism? Uh, why are they called the tourists? Why tourists? Oh, that seemed like such a great idea, great title. It's just obvious, you know, we're on tour, you know. I mean, the ads you see for joining the army these days, you know, like, come travel to exciting places. They, they, they present it like a sort of gap year kind of thing, you know what I mean? Come and do some backpacking and thing. And then, you know, it, it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, there was, there was a T-shirt from the 1970s which so it's too embarrassing these days because the, we live in a more nuanced time. But back then, the T-shirt, it was just a slogan which said, join the army, travel to foreign places, meet interesting people and kill them. <laughs> you know? the, the, this, this, this obviously doesn't work today, but I mean, the, the, this is a 1970s well, T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know. So, so <laughs> but, but, it's so, so that, but, but so it was about going on tour. It seemed to be a lot. And, and, uh, it, it, it just seemed to be the, the, the right title. And when you have the right title, you grab it with both hands. I, when I come to title pieces of work, it's become agonizing. I've got a file of titles at home, and I, and I look back sometimes and I think, from work I did, say, 15, 16 years ago, why did I waste the good title and the piece of work, man? You know, <laughs> you know I could have I saved it up, you know? <laughs> But did the title just the title just fit, you know? And and quite often they'd be like thesaurus and all, and they go, you know, no, 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 that's the title. Marlene, do you want to put up your hand again? So, Hugh, I'm going to ask you a question that relates to something you you touched on right at the beginning of this uh, this discussion, and that's about ghosts. It's about ghosts and haunting, um, yeah. and I for myself. Often when I encounter your work, not just in this room, but other pieces of work, I, 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 I have that, that question comes into my mind. It's about, so it's a question about, um, we've talked about the afterlife of empire, but I just get a sense of haunting and ghosts and possibly how that might relate to masquerade. And I just wanted to, to ask okay. you. Um, sometimes my work is, is, is to try and allay my fears, personal fears, and this goes back to growing up in Guyana where, um, this is where about, we're aware of the history, you know what I mean? We, we, we're aware that it was a land soaked in blood, you know, and that's to do with slave, slavery and what followed indentureship afterwards. Which indentureship wasn't a pack, bundle of fun at all for, uh, anyway. And um, that's, that's the indentureship for, for in, 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 from, from India. And, uh, or I should say the Indian subcontinent. Um, so, as you're talking, right, I keep thinking of this thing where I, I was talking to this Guyanese writer, Pauline Melville, the other day. And we were talking about our fear of a particular story by this Guyanese writer who's um, long dead, Edgar Mittenhalzer. It's called My Bones and My Flute. And it's about, the f about hearing a flute player. It's about someone on a planet, to hear a flute player in the bush, right? And slowly, once you hear this flute player, you know that it, the, the, the music will get louder and louder and louder. And then you'll see this white man dancing, and he's come for you, basically. You know? And that. Um, is one example of, I mean, it's a lit that's a literal ghost thing, but I mean, the ghost idea, the haunted idea, these houses upstairs, which sometimes may 
when I'm talking with it, discussing what we're doing, we, we discuss all sorts of st all this stuff. Jumbie houses, you know. It's about. It's 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 it's. I grew up in a, a society of where we are aware that you know. Well, I don't believe in ghosts, but. Um, Better not say that too loud because you never know. <laughs> don't don't take the chance, you know. So, so so that's a literal ghost I'm talking about. But then there's a metaphorical thing: the idea of ghosts and hauntings and history haunting how we are today. Uh, so that so this here, this piece here, the title "The Nameless" comes from a John Huston quote, and he is writing about his personal haunting where he's looking down through a series of arches of open doors and a long procession, a nameless procession of people, and realizing that he's just part of this nameless procession of people. And he's looking at his life as a, ha as a, a haunted situation. I'm not haunted, thank God, but um, it's, it's very complex. You know, th these kind of things, I, I'm, rabbit, I'm rambling a bit, but it's very difficult to say in a very short conversation like this, the complexities of what I'm trying to talk about. I talk often about these boats upstairs, and they're again ghostly things. There are no passengers deliberately on them. You are the passenger. You know, you are the person traveling on these things. But where are you going? We don't know, you know? And that's again a haunting, ghostly thing, you know? I think on that note, I mean, uh, if I could sort of speak to that, there's also this idea of um, cohabitation rather than exorcism. Oh yes, yes, yes. You know? so exactly. Exactly. No, no, no. Rid of the no, 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 not at all. Yeah. No, no. You, you learn to live with stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what this is about. You and know. On, and we have Lindsay here, so I think this I've, is a I've signal. Crept, I've crept up on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we've gone from the nameless to the named. And I think, you know, thinking about that naming and what name, you know, what naming does, wh yeah. whether either it's with work titles or it's reading into names. Well, why are the why is there a Singapore or an Algiers or or a Cyprus? I think these are things that we also need to think about and live with. Exactly, uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. You know, Lindsay. Well, um, thank you so much, and I think that's such a brilliant note for us to end on. Um, and I'd, if everyone could join me in thanking Hamad and Hugh for the conversation. Um, so tomorrow, the last day of this installation, please come back and see the video piece um, that we were talking about this evening, which is on the other side of this wall here. Um, we also have a full day of events again, uh, so you'll see, including Osman Yusef Sada's fashion parade, which will be walking um, down New Street and ending at the gallery here. We have music by Celebrating Sanctuary upstairs, um, with the uh, Hughes painting of Queen Victoria in the background. And in the evening, we have um, Jelaine Taudros, um, author of The Sphinx Contemplating Napoleon, which is an upcoming book. Um, that will be coming out this autumn. She's going to chair a discussion with uh, Black Audio Film Collective member Trevor Matheson and Dub Morphology collaborator Gary Stewart. They'll be discussing themes including fear of difference in science fiction and how black British artists in the 1990s were represented. This will be followed by quite a rare screening of a Black Audio Film Collective film called The Last Angel in History, um, which is from the 90s. So please come here again tomorrow um, for those two final events um, in his show. Um, and. Um, also, for now, we haven't quite finished our festivities today. Um, downstairs, we have the Discory. Um, they'll be playing some reggae, ska, uh, dub downstairs in York's Cafe until 10 p.m. Um, we, me and my colleagues are going down there for a drink. Please come and join us. So thank you very much.